This is a painting that hangs in the rectory. It's by Amy Evans. It's called Altar View. Amy painted this for me and Charlotte and gave it to us at the close of our time of ministry in Breckenridge. And at times in my life, it has brought out a range of emotions. Today, it reminds me of a little four-year-old boy who called this his church. His name is Jacob. Jacob was asked by his father as they were working on remembering the names of the seasons of the year, what's the season that comes after fall? And Jacob quickly responded, basketball season. (laughs) Many of the children believed that their parish was special. It was a special place for them and special things happened when they were at this special place called church. Jacob's cousin, Palmer, who is a very sensitive little boy, he always referred to me as the man of church. I like that title, the man of church. Now, Jacob has a sister named Lily, and I baptized Lily. And at the lunch after the baptism, I heard about the children's parish through the eyes of a four-year-old. During my homily, Jacob decided that he needed to help his cousins understand the liturgy of his church. So he said, after all this talking stuff, we go to the altar for bread and wine. Then we say a prayer. Then we get to go to the back while everyone else sings and ring the bell. And then we get to go eat donuts. Children remind us what's really important in life. And in Jacob's case, it's basketball, church, and donuts. Children give us insight into our spirits, which can often, over time, have developed thick defensive walls as we become adults. Children remind us they are a less filtered reflection of love. God's love in and for all people. And that's one of the reasons that Jesus pointed us adults to children and communicated how we as adults are to live as the hands and face and heart of Jesus. Last week, I shared with you that we have reached the turning point in Mark's gospel. And it's a turning point for the disciples as well. Because now some have decided that discipleship is going to demand too much. And so some of them have dropped out looking for a Messiah that doesn't require so much from them. In verse 32, you can see that their silence is really telling. They are misunderstanding Jesus. Not that he hasn't been clear but they haven't wanted to see Jesus for who he is. And this silence at the beginning of our reading today points to them being afraid to ask Jesus about the meaning of his teaching. Perhaps that's where this motto, it's better to remain silent and appear like a fool than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt, got its start. It's not that Jesus hasn't been telling the disciples for some time now what will happen, but we see more and more in Mark's retelling of this narrative that the established lenses and projections that the disciples have, that the person they wanted Jesus to be hadn't made room for what Jesus was. And those projections follow us around too, don't they? Depending on our past, on churches and communities that we've been a part of, We all carry these lenses and projections that then we look at what is now probably one of the most common conversations I have is with folks who have had really horrible experiences in church or that the language of the gospel had been twisted in such a way to make it mean whatever those people wanted it to mean that now The grace of Jesus never gets to be seen because the lens has become so distorted. Many of us have those stories of of what we bring into our understanding of Christ. 
Well, one thing is for sure, the disciples did not see Jesus as a gracious Savior. The emphasis of our narrative today begins with a question, a question all too real for us. What are you arguing about? This debate amongst the smaller group of disciples sounds petty or childish, them strategizing over personal greatness. I don't know if you noticed in the reading that no one is bold enough or foolish enough to offer any excuses on this one. Now, this is the second time in this short reading in our text that they are silent. One minute they're having the equivalent of a parking lot conversation. The next minute you can hear a pin drop. Their silence really indicates their embarrassment as they remained silent. We might also assume that because each disciple was concerned about his own place within the order of the organization, none of them wanted to let the others know that he didn't understand where Jesus was going. And so no one was willing to raise his hand and say, I don't understand, I don't get it, Jesus. Because they knew that would lead to ridicule and that could lead to being considered the dumb disciple. And nobody wanted to be the dumb disciple. I was talking to Dr. Chris Gertis after the service, and he was telling me that in the midst of Stanford, the brightest, most intelligent, that everyone looks around, even in the midst of all of that brilliance, and looks around and they go, I don't know how I got here, because I'm not as smart as everybody else here. And he said this kind of notion that that no one will raise their hand and no one will say, I don't get it. And that as a teacher, Chris has to, from time to time, look at the eyes of everyone in his classes and go, I'm kind of sensing that nobody is tracking with me today and nobody's getting this. And then everybody goes, I'm not the only one that wasn't getting it. The disciples, they didn't want to raise their hand because they might be ridiculed for not getting what Jesus has been saying, but they weren't getting it. That their projections might have been, well, who was going to succeed Jesus if he's going to be put to death as he says he is? Well, who's then going to take the lead here? And the disciples at that point thought of themselves more as managers and not leaders. What Jesus doesn't do, Jesus doesn't dismiss their conversation. He doesn't say not going to happen, or dream on, or no way. Jesus says, if you wish to be great, you're wishing to be first. Okay. But you're going to need to step away from your projections and your previously attached lenses to seek to achieve it by Jesus' means rather than by the world's means. Then Jesus picks up an object lesson, a child, powerless. Their very life depended on someone else. Though sometimes I wonder who's really got the power when my granddaughter Hannah says, Papa, can we? And I try every possible way to make it happen for her. Jesus doesn't say there isn't order or rank within community. Just that the order and our projections have been flipped where those who are powerless, those who are unable to control situations are recognized in our lenses, our worldview as first. Have you ever noticed how unembarrassed children are about asking questions? Until they become much older, children aren't preoccupied with appearing knowledgeable. Part of that may be that our personas are very valuable to us And they support our egos. And the more that we stay within our persona, the more we don't risk being outed as not the smartest person in the room. Children aren't that way. Children aren't hung up on their persona. They learn that from us, adults. Children know and what we forget sometimes that the joy of life isn't so much in the possession of data. The joy of life is an ongoing process of discovery. If we want to act like the disciples, our lenses and our projection through those lenses is going to be fixed and rigid 
and we're going to have a particular view and we're going to stay with that view and not be open to any changes. If we want to act like a disciple, trust will open us to an ongoing process of discovery of ourselves. As Bob Dylan wrote, we are going to serve somebody. Who will we serve? Jesus embraces a child and says, embrace the least, the powerless, and be servant of all. Whoever welcomes a child like this in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me is welcoming the one who sent me.